Hey, what's up YouTube? What's going on guys? The title of today's video is Why Millennials Suck at Adulting. And we're gonna be talking about a BuzzFeed news article uh, titled How Millennials Became the Burnout Generation. Now, uh, these millennial articles tend to do uh, pretty well view-wise and they also tend to stir up a lot of discussion, right? People seem to have uh, very strong opinions on, on the issue of millennials and do they deserve to be shit on and are they lazy, aren't they lazy? Um, and, and typically I take up and stick up for, for millennials. I, I think, um, you know, it's not really fair the, the rep they get. Um, but there are a whole lot of whiny motherfuckers out there. I recently discovered and I actually found this article, um, in a subreddit called the lost generation. Now, I suppose just based on, on the name, we should know that these are going to be like the most pessimistic, uh, whiny among us, uh, you know, among us being millennials. Um, but like, it's just a bunch of, they have some interesting articles, right? Like, are there systematic problems with the world today? Like, did millennials in some ways get the short end of the stick? Like, yeah, there, there's problems. Wages don't keep up with the cost of housing. Health insurance is out of control. The cost of education is out of control. Uh, employers are wanting to get more out of us than ever. Uh, there are a lot of issues, but at the same time, you know, the, the way society is has a lot of benefits as well. You know, your grandparents could not start a side hustle. There was much less chance of upward mobility based on your own efforts. Um, so in that sense, we kind of got something going for us. But if we look at this, like, it's a lot of whiny articles. Oh, here's the article burnout right here. Um, the early to rise myth. And this one is a bunch of people whining about how they're not morning people. And it's not fair that society wants people to work eight to five or nine to five because they're not more morning people. And everyone needs to rise up and it's not fair. And we should rise up and we should make the world, you know, work according to our schedules. And, you know, whenever me or somebody else pops in here, I've only been kind of a part of this forum for a few days. But you pop in here and say something like, look, you're, you're not a morning person. Get a job, get a second shift shift job where you start at two o'clock in the afternoon, or why not develop a, a skill set that allows you to work remotely or work on your own schedule? And it's a lot of like, oh, well, that's easy for you to say. And da, 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 you know, it's, it's just a lot of griping and bitching and moaning and whining. Um, but they, they do have some interesting articles. Um, anyhow, that's where I discovered this article. And I gave this a read the other day. My girlfriend was watching TV and I was kind of only half paying attention, perusing it. Uh, but it's pretty interesting, and there's actually a lot of things that are very relatable in here. I don't know if any of you guys find that even if you're successful in your career and you're pretty motivated and 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 things like that, there's a lot of little things that tend to slip through the cracks. Like millennials suck at running errands, <laughs> um, and this is something I can relate to. I see a lot of my friends kind of experiencing the same problem, and it's like even if you're you're kind of hard charging and successful and motivated in most areas of your life, little things like maybe mailing a package or registering to vote, these are things that like they're on your to-do list for like a year at a time and they just never ever get done. And this article does kind of an interesting job of kind of addressing why this is. Um, let's see, the, the author says, I couldn't figure out why small straightforward tasks on my to-do list felt so impossible. The answer is both more complex and far sim simpler than I expected. And uh, like I said, I only peruse this, we're gonna give it a read right now, but kind of one of the, the messages throughout the article was like, millennials have so much to do and society is so focused on efficiency that in that a lot of times these things like running to the post office or registering to vote, these things that are very analog or very archaic, uh, there's really no way to streamline them. So we just wind up putting them off and, and not doing them forever. Um, and then also kind of goes to talk about how everything is, is so much about efficiency that nobody, they, they say adulting has become a verb, right? It's, it's, Everything in life is something on your to-do list. And I, I notice this with myself, with, with my friends, with family members um, who are millennials, even things like spending time with your friends or uh, doing something with family, these things that are supposed to be enjoyable things um, become just another thing to do. And you know, I'll oftentimes hear, actually it was just like last weekend, uh, my girlfriend and my girlfriend's sister-in-law uh, we're talking about going over to a friend's house. We do it like a friend's giving every year. Um, and it, it, a lot of times it falls away after Thanksgiving just because family obligations and things. But we essentially have a Thanksgiving with, with a group of friends. And, uh, they were both like, Oh, I can't believe we have to go over to so and so's house for, for friends giving on Saturday. Uh, another thing to do. I got so many things to do. And it's like here, you know, celebrating, you know, being thankful and, and celebrating our, our friendships in the year with friends and having some drinks and having dinner together. Like that should be something fun that we look forward to. And it's just another thing on the to-do list. And that's kind of what this article talks about. Um, so I'd be curious to kind of hear your thoughts on this. This is probably going to be a longer video. This is a longer article, but hopefully you guys find it enjoyable. Um, and again, how millennials became the burnout generation. I couldn't figure out why small, straightforward tasks on my to-do list felt so impossible. The answer is both 
more complex and far simpler than I expected. I tried to register for the 2016 election, but it was beyond the deadline by the time I tried to do it, a man named Tim, age 27, explained to New York Magazine last fall. I hate mailing stuff. It gives me anxiety. Tim was outlining the reasons why he, like 11 other millennials interviewed by the magazine, probably wouldn't vote in the 2018 midterm election. The amount of work logically isn't that much, he continued. Fill out a form and mail it. Go to a specific place on a specific day. But those kinds of tasks can be hard for me to do if I'm not enthusiastic about it. Tim goes on to admit that some friends had helped him register to vote, as he planned to probably make it happen for the midterms. But his explanation, even though as he noted his struggle in this case was caused in part by ADHD, triggered the contemporary tendency to dunk on millennials' inability to complete seemingly basic tasks. Grow up, the overall sentiment goes. Life is not that hard. So this is the way the world ends. Huffington Post congressional reporter Matt Fuller tweeted, not with a bang, but with a bunch of millennials who don't know how to mail things. <laughs> Explanations like Tim's are at the core of the millennial reputation. We're spoiled, entitled, lazy, and failures at what's known to be, quote unquote, adulting. A word invented by millennials as a catch-all for stuff, for tasks that self-sufficient existence. Expressions of adulting do often come off as privileged astonishment at the realities of, well, life. That you have to pay bills and go to work. That you have to buy food and cook it. You want to eat it. That actions have consequences. Adulting is hard because life is hard. Or as a Bustle article admonishes its readers, everything is hard if you want to look at it that way. Millennials love to complain about other millennials giving them a bad name, but it, as I fumed about this 27-year-old's post office anxiety, I was in a deep cycle of tendency developed over the past five years that I've come to call errand paralysis. I put something on my to-do list. I've I've, I'd put something on my weekly to-do list and it'd roll over one week to the next, haunting me for months. None of these tasks were that hard. Getting knives sharpened, taking boots to the cobbler, registering my dog for a new license, sending someone a sign, signed copy of my book, scheduling an appointment at the dermatologist, donating books to the library, vacuuming my car, a handful of emails from one dear friend, one from a former student asking how my life was going, festered in my personal inbox, which I use as a sort of alternative to-do list. I actually do that as well. Like if I need to do something, I'll email it to myself. Uh, to the point that I started calling it the inbox of shame. It's not as if I were slacking in the rest of my life. I was publishing stories, writing two books, making meals, executing a move across the country, planning trips, paying my student loans, exercising on a regular basis. But when it came to the mundane, the medium priority, the stuff that wouldn't make my job easier or my work better, I avoided it. My shame about these errands expands with each day. I remind myself that my mom was pretty much always doing errands. Did she like them? No, but she got them done. So why couldn't I get it together? Especially when the tasks were all, at first glance, easily completed. I realize that the vast majority of these tasks share a common denominator. Their primary beneficiary to me is not in a way that would actually dramatically improve my life. They are seemingly high effort, low reward tasks, and they paralyze me, not unlike the way registering to vote paralyzed a millennial Tim. And here's a quote, we're not feckless teens anymore, we're grown ass adults, and the challenges we face aren't fleeting, but systematic. Tim and I are not alone in this paralysis. My partner was so stymied by the multi-step, incredibly and purposely confusing process of submitting insurance reimbursement forms for every single week of therapy, that for months he just didn't send them and ate over $1,000. Another woman told me she had a package sitting unmailed in the corner of her room for over a year. Uh, one other thing I noticed, I, I don't know if this hits you at all, it's affected me a, a time or two. You have money to pay bills, but you're just too lazy to like send yourself a password reset to go log into your, I don't know, Capital One or Chase account to actually pay the bills. So bills go unpaid, even though you have the ability to pay them. Uh, a friend admitted he's absorbed hundreds of dollars in clothes that don't fit because he couldn't manage to return them. Aaron Paralysis post office anxiety, they're different manifestations of the same affliction. For the past two years, I've refused cautions from editors, from family, from peers, that I might be edging into burnout. To my mind, burnout was something aid workers or high-powered lawyers or investigative journalists dealt with. It was something that could be treated with a week on the beach. I was still working on getting other stuff done. Of course, I wasn't burnt out. But the more I tried to figure out my Aaron paralysis, the more the actual parameters of burnout began to reveal themselves. Burnout and the behaviors and weight that accompany them are in fact something we can, can can cure by going on vacation. It's not limited to workers in acutely high stress environments, and it's not a temporary affliction. The millennial condition. 
It's our base temperature. It's our background music. It's the way things are. It's our lives. That realization recast my recent struggles. Why can't I get this mundane stuff done? Because I'm burned out. Why am I burned out? Because I've internalized the idea that I should be working all the time. Why have I internalized that idea? Because everything and everyone in my life has reinforced it, explicitly and implicitly. Since I was young, life has always been hard, but many millennials are unequipped to deal with the particular ways of life, which it's become hard for us. So what now? Should I meditate more, negotiate for more time off, delegate tasks within my relationship, perform acts of self-care, and institute timers on my social media? How, in other words, can I optimize myself to get those mundane tasks done and theoretically cure my burnout? As millennials have aged into their 30s, that's a question we keep asking and keep failing to adequately answer. But maybe that's because it's the wrong question altogether. For the last decade, millennials has, has been used to describe or ascribe what's right and wrong with the young people. But in 2019, millennials are well into adulthood. The youngest are 22. The oldest, like me, somewhere around 38. That has required a shift in the way people within and outside our generation configure their criticism. We're not feckless teens anymore. We're grown-ass adults, and the challenges we face aren't fleeting, but are systematic. Many of the behaviors attributed to millennials are the behaviors of specific subsets, mostly white, largely middle-class people born between 1981 and 1996. But even if you're millennial, a millennial who didn't grow up privileged, you've been impacted by the societal and cultural shifts that have shaped the generation. Our parents, a mix of young boomers and old Gen Xers, reared us during an age of relative economic and political stability. As with the previous generations, there was an expectation that the next one would be better off, both in terms of health and finances, than the one that had come before. But as millennials enter into their mid-adulthood, that prognosis has been proven false. Financially speaking, most of us lag far behind where our parents were at our age. We have far saved less, far less equity, far less stability, and far, far more student debt. The quote-unquote greatest generation had the Depression and the GI Bill. Boomers had the golden age of capitalism. Gen X had deregulation and trickle-down economics. And millennials, we've got venture capital, but we've also got the 2008 financial crisis, the decline of the middle class, and the rise of the 1%, and a steady decay of unions and stable full-time employment. As American business became more efficient, better at turning a profit, the next generation needed to be positioned to compete. But we couldn't just show up with a diploma and expect to keep a job that would allow us to retire at 55. In a marked shift, shift from the generations before, millennials needed to optimize ourselves to be the very best workers possible. And that process began very early. In Kids These Days, Human Capital and the Making of Millennials, Malcolm Harris lays out a myriad of ways in which our generation has been trained, tailored, primed, and optimized for the workplace. First in school, then through secondary education, starting as, as very young children. Risk management used to be a business practice, Harris writes. Now it's our dominant child rearing strategy. Depending on your age, this idea applies to what our parents did or didn't allow us to do. Play on dangerous playground structures, go out with cell, without cell phones, drive without an adult in the car, and how they allowed us to do these things we did, learn, play, eat, explore. Harris points to practices that we now see as a standard of means of optimizing children's play, an attitude often described as intensive parenting. Running around a neighborhood has become supervised play dates. Unstructured daycare has become preschool. Neighborhood kick the can or pickup games have, transport, have transformed into highly regulated and organized league play that spans a year. Unchanneled energy, diagnosed as hyperactivity, became medicated and disciplined. We didn't try to break the system since that not, that's not how we'd been raised. We tried to win it. My childhood in the late 80s and early 90s was only partially defined by this kind of parental optimization and monitoring, largely because I lived in a rural town in North, Dakota, North Idaho, where such structured activities were scarce. I spent my recess time playing on the very dangerous teeter-totters and merry-go-round. I wore a helmet to bike and skateboard, but my brother and I were the only kids we knew who did. I didn't do internships in high school or college because they weren't yet standard, a standardized component uh, of either experience. I took piano lessons for fun, not for my future. I, I didn't have an SAT prep class. I took the AP class available to me uh, and applied to colleges on paper by hand based on brochures and short write-ups in the best book of colleges. But that was the beginning of the end of that attitude. Toward parenting, toward children's leisure time, toward college selection, and not just among the bourgeois, 
I can never say that word, educated, <laughs> uh, stereotypical helicopter parents. In addition to extensive monitoring, millennial parents are also characterized by vigilant parenting behaviors, whereas sociologist Linda Blum describes a mother's unyielding watchfulness and advocacy for her child takes on the imperative of a lone moral quest. In recent research, recent research has found that the vigilante behaviors cut across race and class lines. Maybe an upper class suburban family is invested in their child getting into an Ivy League school, while a mom in Philadelphia who didn't get a chance to go to college herself is invested in her daughter becoming the first in the family to make it to college. The goals are somewhat different, but the supervision, the attitude, the risk assessment, and the campaign to get the child to that goal are very similar. It wasn't until after college that I began to see the results of those attitudes in action. Four years post-graduation, alumni would complain that the school had filled with nerds. No one even parties on Tuesday. I laughed at the eternal refrain. These younger kids, what dorks, we were way cooler. But not until I returned to campus years later as a professor did I realize just how fundamentally different those students' orientation to school was. There were still obnoxious uh, frat boys and fancy sorority girls, but they were far more studious than my peers had been. They skipped fewer classes, they religiously attended office hours, they emailed at all hours, but they were also anxious grade grubbers, paralyzed at the thought of graduating and regularly stymied by assignments that called for creativity. They had been guided closely all their lives and they wanted me to guide them as well. They were, in a word, scared. Every graduating senior is scared to some degree of the future, but this was on a different level. When my class left our liberal arts experience, we were scattered to temporary gigs. I worked at a dude ranch, another friend nannied for the summer, one got a job on a farm in New Zealand, others became raft guides and transitioned into ski instructors. We didn't think our first job was important. It was just a job that it would it would it was just a job and would eventually meanderingly lead to the job but these students were convinced that their first job out of college would not only determine their career trajectory but also their intrinsic value for the rest of their lives i told one student whose dozens of internships and fellow applications yielded no results that she should move somewhere fun get a job and figure out what interests her and what kind of work she doesn't want to do a suggestion that prompted wailing but what'll I tell my parents, she said. I want a cool job I'm passionate about. Those expectations encapsulate the millennial rearing project in which students internalize the need to find employment that reflects well on their parents, steady, decently paying, and recognized as a quote unquote good job. That's also impressive to their peers at a quote unquote cool company and fulfills what they've been told has been the end goal of this childhood optimization, doing work that you're passionate about. Whether that job is a professional sports player a Patagonia social media manager, a programmer at a startup, or a partner at a law firm seems to matter less than checking all those boxes, or at least that's a theory. So what happens when millennials start the actual search for that holy grail career and start quote unquote adulting, but it doesn't feel at all to them like the dream that had been promised. Like most old millennials, my career path was marked by two financial cat catastrophes, the early 2000s when many of us were first entering college or the workforce and the dot-com bubble burst. The result the resultant financial rubble wasn't as extensive as the 2008 crisis, but it tightened the job market and torpedoed the stock market, which indirectly affected millennials who'd been counting on parents' investments to get them through college. When I graduated with a liberal arts degree in 2003, I moved to Seattle. The city was still affordable, but skilled jobs were in short supply. I worked as a nanny, a housemate worked as an assistant, a friend resorted to selling what would be later known as subprime mortgages. Those two years as a nanny were hard. I stultifyingly bored and commuted an hour in each direction, but it was the last time I remember not feeling burned out. I had a cell phone, but I couldn't even send text. I checked my email once a day on a desktop computer in a friend's room. Because I'd been placed through a nanny agency, my contract included health care, sick days, and paid time off. I made $32,000 a year and paid $500 a, rent a month in rent. I had no student debt from my undergrad and my car was paid off. I didn't save much, but I had money for movies and dinners out. I was intellectually unstimulated, but I was good at my job, caring for two infants, and I had clear demarcations between when I was on and off the clock. Then those two years ended, and the bulk of my friends group began the exodus to grad school. We enrolled in PhD programs, law school, med, architecture school, education master's programs, and BAs. It wasn't because we were hungry for more knowledge. It was because we were hungry for secure middle-class jobs, and we'd been told, correctly or not, that those jobs were only available through grad school. Once we were in grad school and the micro generation behind us was seemingly emerging from college into the workplace, the 2008 financial crisis hit. And here's a quote. I never thought the system was equitable. 
I knew it was only winnable for a few for only a small few. I just believed I could continue to optimize myself and become one of them. The crisis affected everyone in some way, but the way it affected millennials is foundational. It's always defined our experience of the job market. More experienced workers in the newly laid off filled applicant pools for lower and entry level jobs, once largely reserved for recent grads. We couldn't find jobs or could only find part-time jobs, jobs without benefits or jobs that were actually uh, multiple side hustles cobbled together into one job. As a result, we moved back home with our parents. We got roommates. We went back to school. We tried to make it work. We were problem solvers after all and taught that if we just worked harder, it would work out. On the surface, it did work out. The economy recovered. Most of us moved out of our parents' houses. We found jobs, but we couldn't find, but what we couldn't find was financial security. Because education, grad school, undergrad, vocational school, online, was situated as the best and only way to survive. Many of us emerged from those programs with loan payments that our postgraduate prospects failed to offset. The situation was even more dire if you entered a for-profit school where the average total debt for a four-year degree is $39,950, and the job prospects post-graduation are even bleaker. As I continued through grad school, I accumulated more and more debt. Debt that I rationalized, like so many in my generation, as the only means to achieve the end goal of one, a good job that would, two, be, be or sound cool, and three, allow me to follow my quote-unquote passion. In this case, full-time tenure-track employment as a media studies professor. In the past, pursuing a PhD was, generally, was a generally debt-free endeavor. Academics worked their way towards a college degree while, while working as teaching assistants, which paid for the cost of living and remitted the cost of tuition. That model began to shift in the 1980s, particularly at public universities forced to compensate for state budget cuts. Teaching assistant labor was far cheaper than paying for a tenured professor, so the universities didn't just keep PhD programs, but expanded them, even with dwindling funds to adequately pay for those students. Still, thousands of PhD students clung to the idea of a tenure track professorship. And the tighter the academic market became, the harder we worked. We didn't try to break the system since that's how we'd been raised. We tried to win it. I never thought the system was equitable. I knew it was winnable for only a small few. I just believed I could continue to optimize myself and become one of them. And it's taken me years to understand the true ramifications of that mindset. I worked hard in college, but as an old millennial, the expectations for labor were tempered. We like to say we worked hard, played hard, and there were clear boundaries around each of those activities. Grad school then is where I learned to work like a millennial, which is to say all the time. My new watchword was everything that's good is bad. Everything that's bad is good. Things that should have felt good, leisure not working felt bad because I felt guilty for not working. Things that should have felt bad, working all the time, felt good because I was doing what I thought I needed to be doing in order to succeed. Let's see, uh, we put up with companies treating us poorly because we don't see another option. We don't quit. We internalize that we're not striving hard enough and we get a second gig. In my master's program, graduate students' labor was arguably, arguably exploited, but we were ununionized un, <laughs> un and compensated in a way that made emerging from the program without debt possible. Our health insurance was solid, class sizes were manageable, but that all changed in my PhD program in Texas, a right to work state where unions, if they existed at all, had no bargaining power. I was paid enough to cover a month's rent in Austin with $200 left for anything else. I taught classes as large as 60 students on my own. The only people in my cohort who didn't have to take out loans had partners in quote unquote real jobs or family money. Most of us were saddled with debt for the privilege of preparing ourselves for no job prospects. Either we kept working or we failed. So we took those loans with the assurance from the federal government that if after graduation we went to a public service field, such as teaching at college or university, and paid a percentage of our loans on time for 10 years, the rest would be forgiven. Last year, the first in which eligible graduates could apply for forgiveness, just 1% of applicants were accepted. When we talk about millennial student debt, we're not talking about the payments that keep millennials from participating in American institutions like homeownership or purchasing diamonds. It's also about the psychological toll of realizing that something you've been told and came to believe would be quote unquote worth it, worth the loans, worth the labor, worth all that self-optimization, isn't. One thing that makes that realization sting even more is watching others live their seemingly cool, passionate, worthwhile lives online. We all know what we see on Facebook or Instagram isn't real, but that doesn't mean we don't judge ourselves against it. I find that millennials are far less jealous of objects or belongings on social media than the holistic experiences represented there. 
the sort of thing that prompts people to comment, I want your life. That inevitable mix of leisure and travel, the accumulation of pets and children, the landscape inhabited and the food consumed seems not just desirable, but balanced, satisfied, and unafflicted by burnout. And though work itself is rarely pictured, it's always there. Periodically, it's photographed as a space that's funny or zany and always rewarding or gratifying, but most of the time, it's a thing that you're getting away from. You worked hard enough to enjoy life. It's not a temporary affliction. It's the millennial condition. It's our base temperature. It's our background music. It's the way things are in our lives. You know, but before we carry on, I just had kind of an interesting thought as I was reading this the other day. So um, I don't know if any of you guys were, were fans of the show Friends or um, what's the other one? How I Met Your Mother. Um, but I, in a sense, I almost feel like that was the social media of, I don't even know how long ago those shows aired, 10, 15 years ago. Um, like, yeah, social media is a bit more real because we see quote unquote real people or maybe our friends living these amazing lives. But I remember back like watching friends, people would talk about, you know, who has, who has all day to sit around in a coffee shop doing nothing but sitting around chatting? Like, don't these people work? Or with how I met your mother, like, how are these people, how do they afford to be at the bar every night? How do they stay out to the bar till all hours? Like, don't they work? Um, and so I almost feel like kind of like television sitcoms back then were kind of the social media of today. You know, television sitcoms, I think they say like the average lifestyle portrayed in one of those shows is somebody making like $300,000 a year. Um, yet they work in coffee shops, yet they can still live right outside of Times Square. Like, I, I feel like sitcoms of, of like the 90s and early 2000s were kind of the social media of that decade in, in the sense that social media, um, you know, supposedly like depresses people these days. Uh, the social media feed and Instagram in particular is thus evident of the fruits of hard rewarding labor and the labor itself. The photos and videos that induce the most jealousy are those that suggest the perfect equilibrium. Work hard, play hard has been reached. But of course, for most of us, it isn't. Posting on social media, after all, is a means of narrating, narrativizing our own lives. What we're telling ourselves, our lives are like. And when we don't feel the satisfaction we've been told we should receive from a job that's fulfilling, balanced with a personal life that's equally so, uh, the best way to convince yourself you're feeling it is to illustrate it for others. For many millennials, a social media presence on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter has also become an integral part of it of obtaining and maintaining a job. The purest example is social media influencer whose entire income source performing and mediating the self online. But social media is the means through which many knowledge workers, that is workers who handle process or make meaning of information, market and brand themselves. Journalists use Twitter to learn about other stories, but they also use it to develop a personal brand, a following that can be leveraged, People use LinkedIn not just for resumes and networking, but to post articles that attest to their personality, their brand, as a manager or entrepreneur. Millennials aren't the only, only ones doing this, but we're the only ones who've perfected and thus set the standard for doing so. Branding is a fitting word for this work, as it underlines what the millennial self becomes, a product. As in childhood, the work of optimizing that brand blurs whatever boundaries remain between work and play. There is no off the clock when at all hours you could be documenting your on-brand experiences or tweeting your on-brand observations. The rise of smartphones makes these behaviors frictionless and thus more pervasive, more standardized. In the early days of Facebook, you had to take pictures with your digital camera, upload them to your, your computer, and post them in albums. Now your phone is a sophisticated camera, always ready to document every component of your life. In easily manipulated photos, in short video bursts, in constant updates to Instagram stories, and to facilitate the labor of performing the self-public consumption. To adult is to complete your to-do list, but everything goes on the list and the list never ends. But the phone is also just as essentially a tether to the real world workplace. Email and Slack make it so that employees are always accessible, always able to labor, even after they've left the physical workplace and the tra traditional nine to five boundaries of paid labor. Attempts to discourage working off the clock misfire as millennials read them as not permission to stop working, but as a means to further distinguish themselves from being away. And you know what's kind of interesting here? I was actually just having a discussion with a friend about this the other day. I've noticed a lot of companies have transitioned into unlimited vacation time. And while it seems amazing, right? I can take as much vacation as I want. Uh, here's what I think the reality is like. People feel so bad or so guilty about taking time off that they wind up not taking as much time off as they would take off if they were just given an allotted amount of time. 
The, uh, the last job I had, I had worked my way up to having three weeks of vacation. And you better believe, since I had three weeks of vacation, I was going to take every one of those three weeks. However, if I were to start a job tomorrow and they told me you have unlimited vacation, you know, well, well what's, what does unlimited really mean? What's an acceptable amount of time to take off? What would wind up happening is I would probably wind up taking one week off for the entire year and then feeling too bad to take any more time off to where I would have been better off if you just told me you get a week off or you get two weeks off or you get three weeks off. I also think this unlimited vacation means, hey, we're giving you all this flexibility and all this time off. So you can take off whenever you want, but you're also expected to work when you're away. Um, just kind of a, a side commentary that I had there. Uh, we are encouraged to strategize and scheme to find places, times, and roles where we can be efficiently put to work. Harris, the Kids These Days author, writes, efficiency is our existential purpose, and we are a generation of finely honed tools crafted from embryos to be lean, mean production machines. But as sociologist Arnie Kellberg points out, that efficiency was supposed to give us more job security, more pay, and perhaps even more leisure. In short, better jobs. Yet the more we work, the more efficient we've proven ourselves to be, the worse our jobs become. Lower pay, worse benefits, less job security. Our efficiency hasn't bucked wage stagnation, but our steadfastness has made us more valuable. If anything, our commitment to work, no matter how exploitative, has become encouraged and facilitated our exploitation. We put up with companies treating us poorly because we don't see another option. We don't quit. We internalize that we're not striving hard enough and we get a second gig. All of this optimization as children in college online culminates in the dominant millennial condition. Regardless of race or clash, class, or location, burnout. Burnout was first recognized as a psychological diagnosis in 1974, applied by psychologist Herbert Fraudenberger to, to the case of physical or mental collapse caused by overwork or stress. Burnout is of a substantially different category than exhaustion, although it's related. Exhaustion means going to the point where you can't go any further. Burnout means reaching the point and pushing yourself to keep going, whether for days, weeks, or even years. What's worse, the feeling of accomplishment that follows all an exhausting task, passing the final, finishing that massive work project, it never comes. The exhaustion experience and burnout combines an intense yearning for this state of completion with the tormenting sense that it cannot be obtained, that there is always some demand or anxiety or distraction which can't be silenced, Josh Cohen, a psychoanalyst specializing in burnout writes. You feel burnout when you've exhausted all your internal resources, yet you cannot free yourself from the nervous compulsion to go on regardless. In his writing about burnout, Cohen is careful to note that it ant excedents, <laughs> uh, melancholic, work, melancholic work weariness, as he puts it, is noted in the book of, man, what a bunch of big words, huh? Ecclesiates, diagnosed by hypocrites, Hippocrates, an academic of the, Ren uh, say that three times fast, huh? The Renaissance, a symptom of bewilderment, bewilderness with the feeling of relentless change. In the late 1800s, neurothanasia or nervous exhaustion afflicted patients run down by the pace and strain of modern industrial life. Burnout differs in its intensity and its prevalence. It isn't an affliction experienced by relatively few that evidence the darker qualities of change, but increasingly and particularly among millennials, the contemporary condition. People patching together a retail job uh, with unpredictable scheduling while well driving for Uber and arranging childcare have burnout. Startup workers with fancy catered lunches, free laundry service, and 70 minute commutes have burnout. Academics teaching four adjunct classes and surviving on food stamps while trying to publish research in one last attempt to snaggle a tenure track job have burnout. Freelance graphic artists operating on their own schedule without health care or paid time off have burnout. One of the ways we think through the mechanics of millennial burnout is by looking closely at the various objects and industries and industries by our generation has supposedly killed. We've killed diamonds because we're getting married later or not at all. And if we do, it's rare for one partner to have the financial stability to set aside the traditional two month salary for a diamond engagement ring. We're killing antiques, opting instead for fast furniture, not because we hate our grandparents' old items, but because we're chasing stable employment across the country and lugging furniture in fragile China costs money and we don't have it. We've changed sit-down casual dining, Applebee's and TGI Fridays for fast casual, Chipotle, uh, but because we're going to pay for something, it should either be an experience worth waiting in line for, Cronuts, the world-famous barbecue Mofuku, uh, or efficient as hell. Even the trend millennials have popularized, like athleisure, 
speak to our self-optimization. Yoga pants might look sloppy to your mom, but they're efficient. You can transition seamlessly from an exercise class to a Skype meeting, meeting to pick up your child. We use Fresh Direct and Amazon because the time they save allows us to do more work. This is why the fundamental criticism of millennials that we're lazy and entitled is so frustrating. We hustle so hard that we figured out how to avoid wasting time eating meals and are called entitled for asking for fair compensation and benefits like working remotely so we can live in affordable cities, adequate health care, or 401ks so we can theoretically stop working at some point before the day we die. We're called whiny for talking frankly about just how much we work or how exhausted we are. But because overworking for less money isn't always visible because job hunting now means trawling LinkedIn because overtime now means replying to emails in bed. The extent of our labor is often ignored or degraded. Um, let's see. The thing about American labor after all is that we're trained to erase it. The thing about American labor after all is that we're trained to erase it. Anxiety is medicated. Burnout is treated with therapy that's slowly becoming normalized and yet still softly stigmatized. Time in therapy after all is time you could be working. No one would have told my grandmother that churning butter and doing the wash by hand wasn't work, but planning a week of healthy meals for a family of four, figuring out a grocery list, finding time to get the grocery store, and then preparing and cleaning up after those meals while holding down a full-time job, that's motherhood, not labor. Millennial burnout often works differently among women, and particularly straight women with families. Part of this has to do with what's known as the second shift, the idea that women who've moved into the workplace to do the labor of a job and then come home and perform the labor of a homemaker. A recent study found that mothers in the workplace spend just as much time taking care of their children as stay-at-home mothers did in 1975. One might think that when women work, the domestic labor decreases or splits between both partners, but sociologist Judy Wachman found that in heterosexual couples, that simply wasn't the case. Less domestic labor takes place overall, but that labor still largely falls on the women. Uh, the labor that causes burnout isn't just physically putting away the dishes or folding the laundry. Tasks that can be read, read, readably distri uh, distributed among the rest of the family. It's more to do with what French cartoonist Emma calls the mental load, or the scenario in which one person in the family, often a woman, takes the role akin to house management project leader. The manager doesn't just complete chores, they keep the entire household schedule in their minds. They remember to get toilet paper because it'll run out in four days. They're ultimately responsible for the health of the family, the upkeep of the home, and their own bodies. Maintaining a sex life, cultivating an emotional bond with their children, uh, overseeing aging parents' care, making sure bills are paid, and neighbors are greeted as someone's home for a service call and holiday cards get in the mail, and vacations are planned six months in advance, and airline miles aren't expiring, and a dog's getting exercised. Women have told me that reading Emma's cartoon, which has gone viral many times over, brought them to tears. They've never seen the particular work that they do described, let alone acknowledged, and for millennials, the domestic work is now supposed to check a never-ending number of aspirational boxes. Outings should be experiences. Food should be healthy and homemade and fun. Body should be sculpted. Wrinkles should be minimized. Clothes should be cute and fashionable. Sleep should be regulated. Relationships should be healthy. The news should be read and processed. Kids should be given personal attention and thriving. Millennial parenting is, as a recent New York Times article put it, relentless. The media that surrounds us, both social and mainstream, from Mario Kondo's new Netflix show to the lifestyle influencer economy, tells us that our personal spaces should be optimized just as much as oneself and career. The end result isn't just fatigue, but enveloping burnout that follows us home and back. The most common prescription is quote unquote self-care. Give yourself a face mask, go to yoga, use your meditation app, but a bunch of self-care isn't care at all. It's an $11 billion industry whose end goal isn't to alleviate the burnout cycle, but provide a further means of self-optimization. At least in its contemporary commodified iteration, self-care is, isn't a solution, it's exhausting. The modern millennial, for the most part, views adulthood as a series of actions as opposed to a state of being. An article in the Elite Daily explains, adulting therefore becomes a verb. To adult is to complete your to-do list, but everything goes on the list and the list never ends. I'm really struggling to find the Christmas magic this year, one woman wrote in a Facebook group focused on self-care recently. I have two little kids, two and six months, and while we had fun reading Christmas books and singing songs, walking around the neighborhood to look at lights, I mostly feel like it's just a to-do list superimposed over my already overwhelming to-do list. I feel so burned out commiserate or advice. And that's kind of what I was talking about earlier with, uh, 
you know, even activities with friends, which should be experiences and part of life and things that we en enjoy and look forward to, they become tasks to do. You know, I said my girlfriend and, and my and her sister-in-law uh, the other weekend were like complaining about uh, there's always something to do every week and we have to go to Friendsgiving, which is something that you should be uh, should be looking forward to. It's something that should be fun. Uh, that's one of the most ineffable and frustrating expressions of burnout. It takes things that should be enjoyable and flattens them into a list of tasks intermingled with other obligations that should either be easily or dutifully completed. The end result is everything from wedding celebrations to registering to vote becomes tingled with resentment and anxiety and avoidance. Maybe my inability to get the knives sharpened is less about being lazy and more about being too good for too long and being a millennial. Uh, there are a few ways to look at this original problem of Aaron paralysis. Many of the tasks millennials find paralyzing are ones that are impossible to optimize for efficiency, either because they remain stubbornly analog, i.e. the post office, or because companies have optimized themselves and their labor so as to make the experience as arduous as possible for the user, anything to do with insurance or bills or filing a complaint. Something ineffable are part of the point. The harder it is to submit a request for reimbursement, the less likely you are to do it. The same goes for returns. Other tasks become, bit, become difficult because of too many options and what's become known as decision fatigue. I've moved around so much because of my career path and always loathe the process of finding family practitioners and dentists and dermatologists. Finding a doctor, and not just any doctor, but one who will take your insurance, who is accepting new patients, might seem like an easy task in the age of ZocDoc, but the array of options can be paralyzing without the recommendations of friends and family, which are in short supply when you move to a brand new town. Other tasks are, well, boring. I've done them too many times. The payoff for completing them is too small. Boredom with the monotony of labor is usually associated with physical and or assembly line jobs, but it's widespread among knowledge workers. As Carolyn Beaton, who has written extensively about millennials and labor, points out, the rise of the knowledge sector has simply changed the medium of monotony from heavy, heavy machinery to digital, digital technology. We habituate to the modern workforce's high intensity, but predictable tasks. Because the stimuli don't change, we cease to be stimulated. The consequence is twofold. First, kind of a Chinese water torture. Each identical thing becomes, becomes increasingly painful. In defense, we become decreasingly engaged. My refusal to respond to a kind Facebook DM is thus, thus sympathetic of the sheer number of calls to my attention online. Calls to read an article. Calls to promote my own work. Calls to engage wittingly or defend myself from trolls or a relative's picture of their baby. Um, to be clear, none of these explanations are, to my mind, exonerating. They don't seem like a great rational reasons to avoid things, I know. In the abstract, I want, to, I want or need to do, uh, but dumb, illogical decisions are a symptom of burnout. We engage in self-destructive behaviors or take refuge in avoidance as a way to get off the treadmill of our to-do list, which explains which helps explain one of the complaints about millennials' work habits. They show up late, they miss shifts, they ghost on jobs. Some people who behave this way may indeed just not know how to put their heads down and work, but far more likely is that they're bad at work because of just how much work they do, especially when it's performed against a backdrop of financial precariousness. We are beginning to understand what ails us, and it's not something an, ox an oxygen facial or a treadmill desk can fix. In recent years, new scientific research has demonstrated the massive cognitive load on those who are financially insecure. Living in poverty is akin to losing 13 IQ points. Millions of millennial Americans live in poverty. Millions of others straddle the line, getting by but barely doing so, often working contingent jobs with nothing left over for the sort of security blanket that could lighten the cognitive load. To be poor is to have little mental bandwidth to make decisions, good or otherwise. As a parent, as a worker, as a partner, as a citizen, the steadier our lives get, the more likely we are to make decisions that will make them even steadier. But steadiness isn't a word we use to describe contemporary American life, and depending on your religion, immigration status, ethnicity, sexual identity, chances are the election of Donald Trump has only made one's future and safety and employability less stable. I really don't see the need to throw Trump in here, but whatever. Uh, healthcare and coverage of pre-existing conditions is seemingly always in question and or in peril, as, as are women's reproductive rights. War with North Korea looms. We've never recognized social media and smartphones as more toxic and more necessary. Our primary concern with the incredibly volatile stock market is 
how its temperament affects our day-to-day -day employment. The planet is dying. Democracy is under serious threat. American adults report being 39% more anxious than a decade ago. And what is anxiety if not the condition of trying to live under these conditions? Pundits spend a lot of time saying this is not normal, but the only way for us to survive day to day is to normalize the events, the threats, the barrage of information, the costs, the expectations of us. Burnout isn't a place to visit and come back from. It's our permanent residence. In his writing about burnout, psychoanalyst Cohen described a client who came to him with extreme burnout. He was a quintessential millennial child, optimized for perfect performance, which paid off when he got his job as a high-powered finance banker. He'd done everything right and was continuing to do everything right in his job. One morning, he woke up, turned off his alarm, rolled over, and refused to go to work. He never went back to work again. He was intrigued to find the termination of his employment didn't bother him. The movie version of this story, this man moves to an island to rediscover the good life or figures out he loves woodworking and opens a shop. But that's the sort of fantasy solution that makes a millennial burnout so pervasive. You don't fix burnout by going on vacation. You don't fix it through life hacks like Inbox Zero or by using meditation apps for five minutes in the morning or by doing Sunday meal prep for the entire family or starting a bullet journal. You don't find it by reading a book on how to unfuck yourself. You don't fix it with vacation or an adult coloring book or anxiety baking or the Pomodoro technique or overnight fucking oats. <laughs> uh, the problem with holistic and all-consuming burnout is that there's no solution to it. You can't optimize to make it end faster. You can't see it coming like a cold and start taking the burnout prevention version of airborne. The best way to treat it is to first acknowledge it for what it is, not a passing ailment, but a chronic illness, and to understand its roots, its parameters. That's why people I talked to felt such relief reading the mental load cartoon and why Harris's book felt so cathartic for me. They don't excuse why we behave the way we do. They just describe those feelings and behaviors and the larger system of capitalism and patriarchy that contribute to them accurately. To describe millennial burnout accurately is to acknowledge the multiplicity of our lived reality that we're not just high school students or graduates or parents, knowledge workers, but above all, while we recognize our status quo, we deeply in debt working more hours and more jobs to pay for less and less security, struggling to achieve the same standards of living our parents, operating in psychological and physical pre precariousness, and while being told that if we just work harder, meritocracy will prevail and will begin to thrive. The carrot dangling in front of us is the dream that the to-do list, or at least, became far more manageable. Uh, but individual action isn't enough. Personal choices alone won't keep the planet from dying or get Facebook to quit violating our privacy. To do that, you need paradigm shifting change, which helps explain why so many millennials increasingly identify with democratic socialism and are embracing unions. Uh, we are beginning to understand what ails us and not something an oxygen facial or treadmill desk can fix. Uh, our capacity to burn out and keep working is our greatest value. Um, until or in lieu of revolutionary overthrow of the capitalist. I don't really like how this kind of gets so anti-capitalist. I, I don't know that this is a, a Republican or Democrat or a left or right issue, uh, but whatever, we'll keep reading. Uh, until or in lieu of a revolutionary overthrow of the capitalist system, how can we hope to lessen or prevent instead of just temporary staunch burnout? Change might come from legislation or collective action or continued feminist ad advocacy, um, but it's a folly to imagine that it will come from companies themselves. Our capacity to burn out and keep working is our greatest value. While writing this piece, I was orchestrating a move, planning travel, picking up prescriptions, walking my dog, trying to exercise, making dinner, attempting to participate in work con conversations on Slack, posting photos to social media, and reading the news. I was waking up at 6 a.m. to write, packing boxes over lunch, moving piles of wood at dinner, falling into bed at nine. I was on a treadmill of a to-do list, one damn thing after another. But as I finish this piece, I feel something I haven't felt in a long time, Casarthus. I feel great. I feel something, which is something that I've really felt upon the completion of a task in some time. There are still things to tackle after this, but for the first time, I'm seeing myself, the parameters of my labor, and the causes of my burnout clearly. And it doesn't feel like the abyss. It doesn't feel hopeless. It's not a problem I can solve, but it's a reality I can acknowledge, a paradigm through which I can understand my actions. In their writings on homelessness, social psychologist Devin Prince has said that laziness, at least in the way most of us generally conceive it, simply does not exist. If a person's behavior doesn't make sense to you, they write, it is because you are missing part of their context. It's that simple. My behavior didn't make sense to me because I was missing part of the context. Burnout. I was too ashamed to admit I was experiencing it. I fancied myself too strong to succumb to it. 
I had narrowed my definition of burnout to exclude my own behaviors and symptoms, but I was wrong. I think I have some of the answers to specific questions that made me start writing this essay. Yours are probably somewhat or substantially different. I don't have a plan of action other than to be honest with myself about what I am and am not doing and why and try to disentangle myself from the idea that everything is bad, everything good is bad and everything bad is good. This isn't a task to complete or an online to-do list or even a New Year's resolution. It's a way of thinking about life and what joy and meaning we can derive from just optimizing it, but from living it, which is another way of saying it's life's actual work. So um, I'm still kind of confused about what the overall message of this was. It, it, it's really long, but I, I definitely feel like uh, there's probably some things in this article that, that I think a lot of us can relate to. And I think a lot of us can kind of relate to um, the idea that things have become so efficient that nobody really enjoys anything anymore. So I uh, just thought this article was kind of food for thought. Like I said, these kind of millennial and kind of life today um, articles and issues tend to get a lot of views. They tend to stir up a lot of discussion. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. If so, go ahead and give it a thumbs up. If you're not subscribed to the channel, click that subscribe button below. And until next time, guys, Rules for Rebels, sign in the fuck out.